I am very good at passing for human, if I say so myself. I have learned the customs and habits perfectly, so that I seem entirely normal. That's how I am able to pass even in the most human of places. For example, the mall, which is a place full of shops, most of which sell artificial skin and artificial hooves, technically known as clothing and shoes. There is even a small church in which young attention-seekers dress in torn black t-shirts and wear spiked wristbands that are somehow useless in combat, and they seem to worship a god named Jack Skellington. I'm an alien, and even I think these kids are kind of douchebags. <laughs> Oh, that's right, I do these too. I'm a nerd, and as such, I love tight continuity. I love it when plot threads and themes from previous installments of something are not only not forgotten, but are later made relevant again as a natural progression of the story. Animorphs isn't always the greatest at this. The oatmeal barrel exploding in the yerk pool in number 17 The Underground never being brought up again is a good example of how the series righteously fails. But when Animorphs does pull it off, it tends to be pretty awesome. And this book, number 18 The Decision, is one of the best examples of this, combining half a dozen previously established ideas into one story pretty effortlessly. The book begins in a unique fashion, with Axe basically summarizing the story we're about to read. This gives the book the air of an official document, meant to be read by Andalite officials, which is a nice change of pace from the poor man's autobiography style of the other books. Though I question why Axe would properly start off his report with the story of him going to the mall and getting hyperglycemic shock from eating a tray of stale cinnamon buns. Cookies! I'll leave the opening chapter hijinks to your imagination. It has nothing to do with anything in the rest of the book. But I do want to point out that, for the first time, Axe goes to the mall alone. That's kind of scary when you think about it. Of course, Jake and the rest of the Animorphs aren't all that upset with Axe. Causing a huge scene in public and involving paramedics? Eh, that's okay. But goddammit, Rachel, if you stop one more man from raping you... The story proper begins with the Animorphs meeting with Eric King in the woods for a bit of intel. It turns out that the Yerks have made an attempt at making Hewlett Aldershot III, the number two guy in the Secret Service, a controller. The plan included running him over with a car and infesting him with a Yerk at the hospital which was established to be mostly your controlled back in number six, the capture. Hey, continuity! However, this only resulted in Aldershot ending up in a coma, making him useless. I love the idea that the Yerks are so desperate to get controllers in high-ranking government positions that they just started hitting them with cars. Visitor 3, I'm afraid plan hit him with a car was a failure, though I would like to note that Aldershot did fly around comically like that one scene from Meet Joe Black. I was afraid of this. Well, that leaves us with only one option. Men, break out the clown hammers. American hero. There he goes. <laughs> Boy, I sure hated to do that. <laughs> the Animorphs decide to scope out the situation and see if the Yerks make any further move. Axe, Rachel, and Marco morph Seagull and perch on the windowsill outside of Aldershot's hospital room. Visitor 3 arrives in Human Morph, demorphs, and scolds the year controlled doctors for not being able to bring Aldershot out of his coma. Hey, hey, maybe it works like amnesia, and you need to hit him with a car again. Visitor 3 works out a plan B. He's going to acquire and morph Aldershot, and use that to get to the number one Secret Service guy. So for once, Visitor 3 knows how to take lemons and make lemonade instead of just resorting to decapitation. Visitor 3 finally notices the seagulls outside, and quickly morphs the many-winged caffet bird that we were introduced to back in the Andalite Chronicles. 
Vizier is an alien bird, bursts through the window, and chases them in public to a nearby McDonald's rooftop, marking reason 1,435 for why Animorphs would never work in the age of cell phone cameras. The Vizier and Axe demorph and square off for a duel, but between the rest of the Animorphs surrounding the Vizier and him probably recognizing Axe as the Andalite that nearly killed him back in number 8 the Alien, Vizier 3 makes a hasty retreat into a dumpster below. Axe spends a sleepless night worrying about what just happened. The Caffet Bird the Vizier morphed comes from the Andalite homeworld, and Axe is worried that this might mean that the Vizier has been to the homeworld. Axe brings this up with Tobias, who theorizes that perhaps the Vizier acquired it from some kind of intergalactic zoo, which we learned in the Andalite Chronicles do exist. Of course, the rather obvious third option is never brought up. What if Aloran simply acquired the Caffet Bird before he became a controller? The Andalite Chronicles implies that the Caffet Bird is a pretty popular morph, and a practical one too, so I can't help but feel that we're worrying about nothing here. However, in number 8 the Alien, as Aloran was passing out from rattlesnake poison, he mentioned to Axe that the Yerks had infiltrated the homeworld, and this is the first time since that book that we begin to wonder what Aloran meant by that. The next day, the Animorphs formulate a plan. They're going to acquire Aldershot as well, sneak into the Secret Service, and reveal the Yerk invasion. To do that, they'll morph Mosquito, fly into the hospital, draw some blood, and use that to acquire Aldershot, and luckily, Cassie just happens to have a box of live mosquitoes around. Cassie? You got some weird hobbies. However, the idea of morphing Aldershot sets off Cassie's moral censors. We don't do that, Cassie said. I thought we decided we don't do that. We don't morph humans. I morphed Prince Jake, I said. I was excited by Marco's idea. But there are times when my human friends are reluctant to do whatever it takes to hurt the Yerks. Sometimes so am I. And Cassie morphed Rachel that time, Tobias said. First of all, Axe, you're not a human, so maybe it's okay if you morph Jake. Besides, Jake would have given his permission if he hadn't been infested with a Yerk. And Rachel did give me her permission, Cassie said. Okay, shut up, Cassie. You so did not ask Rachel for her permission. I read the goddamn book. And if Axe being a different species makes it okay for him to morph Jake, then why were you getting all uptight about morphing dolphins? Stupid, stupid Cassie. Why can't you be like the Cassie from number 16, The Warning? Anyway, the Animorphs end up going with the plan. Axe flies into and demorphs inside the hospital, walks up to the Eldershot hospital room, which is full of controllers, and causes a distraction. I surrender, I cried. I want a defect. What? I wish to defect. I am interested in joining the Yerks. I would like to become a controller. Do you have any information on membership? Is there a fee? This confuses the guards long enough for Axe to knock one of them out and jump out the window. Landing in the bushes, Axe morphs Mosquito and makes his way back up to the room, where the rest of the Animorphs are waiting for him. Axe is about to take a bite when... The Animorphs find themselves teleported to the empty white void that is Z-Space which you may remember is the shortcut system for intergalactic space travel, as well as the junk drawer for all the extra mass when someone morphs something smaller than themselves. They begin to suffocate, but before they pass out, the Andalite ship SS fucking convenient flies by. Axe awakens in an Andalite sickbay, where he meets three Andalites with names I won't bother to remember, so we'll just call them the Captain, the Technical Officer, and the Doctor. It seems the Anors have just proven a scientific theory that... When in morph, one's consciousness may enter the Z-space mass, meaning the Animorphs exist both in their unmorphed forms and as mosquitoes back on Earth at the same time. You might remember ideas like this being explored when Axe originally explained Z-space back in number 10, the Android. <laughs> God, I'm getting a continuity boner. Of course, the Andalites are quite aware that there's no way the humans would be in Z-space unless they had the morphing ability. So Axe tries to take the blame, like he was instructed to, by the Andalite Command back in number 8, the Alien. But he's not a very good liar, and the other Andalites figure out that it was famed War Prince Elfangor that gave them the power to morph. The technical officer is an uptight asshole, but the captain seems kinder and more understanding of the situation, having served under Elfangor in the past. Prince Elfangor did this? the T.O. asked in an odd voice. Prince Alfangor broke the law of Zero's kindness. That speculation will never leave this room, the captain said harshly. 
It was Aerith Aximli who foolishly gave the morphing powers to the humans. But between us, I'll say this. I served under Prince Alfangor. I was his T.O. at one time. And any time Alfangor did something, it was for a good reason. He looked right at me and said, Alfangor was my friend as well as my prince. I'll believe he broke the rules. I'll never believe he did wrong. It turns out the Animorphs are on an assault ship headed toward the homeworld of the Lyrans, those psychic frog aliens, where the Andalites are currently fighting the Yerks over the control of the planet, the Yerk side being led by the Unseen Visor IV. I hope I don't need to remind you of the Yerks' plans to invade the Lyran planet using hammerhead sharks back in number 15, The Escape. The war is being fought on the one major landmass on the entire planet. The Animorphs are, of course, anxious to get back to Earth, and while the Doctor theorizes that there might be a snapback effect that would send their consciousnesses back into their mosquito bodies, that's only a maybe and something that is totally out of the Animorphs' control. Axe then drops a bombshell on the rest of the group. Now reunited with the Andalites, he's leaving the Animorphs and will no longer need Jake to be his prince. And that gets everyone worked up and mad at each other. Really, everyone's kind of in the wrong here. Axe for making such a hasty decision, and the Anorfs for not being more understanding. But everyone has just been violently thrown to the other side of the galaxy to end up in the middle of another war, this one being less infiltration-y and espionage and more boom 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 ga boom So it's understandable that everyone is stressed and irrational. The humans are put into one room until the Andalites can decide what to do with them, while Axe joins the captain and technical officer on the bridge. What do you think of the tactical situation, Earth Exibili? The D.O. asked me. It startled me. He sounded almost friendly. I'm not an expert on... I did not suppose you were, he snapped. I asked for an evaluation. Yes, sir. The Yerks are strong in orbit above the planet. I would say the odds favored them, but they don't want the battle to take place up here. Even if they beat us, they might be too badly damaged to be able to invade and hold the continent below from Lear and counterattack. I see. If they fear the Lyrans on the surface, why take the risk of engaging us and the Lyrans together on the surface? I was out of things to say. Of course the T.O. was right. I must sound like an idiot. The T.O. turned one stock eye to look at me. Because, Erath Aximli, the Yerks understand that different species do not fight well together. We have one way of doing things, the Lyrans a very different way. The Yerks are united under one command. We and the Lyrans are not. The ground war begins just as the assault ship is landing, but suddenly the ship's computers lock up and the ship ends up landing behind Yerk lines. While everyone scrambles to find out what the fuck is going on, the captain suddenly cuts off the technical officer's tail and takes everyone else but Axe out with a laser gun. Ah, my good Aerith, the captain said, holding the shredder on me and taking the T.O. shredder. Don't want to take the chance of injuring you. Visor 4 would be very upset if I injured the creatures who have been causing Visor 3 such trouble on Earth. Visors 3 and 4 are such close friends. Just remain calm. It will be all over in a moment. And you will all be guests of the Yerk Empire. Axe figures to himself that the captain can't be a controller, as there'd be no way to transport a portable Condrona machine without detection. So the captain is a defector. Many have speculated as to why the captain ended up defecting, and while we'll never get any clear answers, here's what I've been able to work out. The only thing we really know is that the captain served under Alfangor and was close friends with him. Close enough to believe that Alfangor could do no wrong, even if he broke Andalite law. Now, as we know from the Andalite Chronicles, Alfangor was a deserter. Giving the option of returning to the Andalites or going with Lorne to Earth, he chose to escape the war and disown his own people. When he did rejoin the Andalites, he did so unwillingly, leaving a wife and son behind. It's therefore not unreasonable to assume that Alfangor retained some resentment over the whole situation, and some of that could have rubbed off on the captain here, giving him the germ of the idea that maybe the Andalites aren't the right horse to back. There's more to it than that, I'm sure, but it's a start, and the only thing I have. Things look bad until the Animorphs reveal that they've been in the room the entire time as insects. Kind of like what happened in Megamorphs 1. Boy, I hope that tactic doesn't backfire at some point. Cassie demorphs on top of the captain, which causes enough of a distraction for Axe to attack and unarm him. 
Acts of the Captain struggle for a bit until the technical officer grabs the shredder and vaporizes the deserter. The technical officer cannot allow the ship and its occupants to fall under Yurk's hands, so he sets the thing to self-destruct. The Animorphs all more flies and are blown out the air hatch and get as far away as possible before the ship explodes.